Good evening, everybody. On behalf of our library director, Catherine Umstadt, and the library's board of trustees, I welcome you all to the Sunderland Public Library. My name is Aaron Falbel. I'm the head of adult services here at the library, and for a few more days, acting director, while our real director, Catherine, finishes up her three-month-long maternity leave. I am truly excited about tonight's presentation by Associate Professor of History, Ian Delahanty, who will discuss his research on slavery's footprint in the Connecticut River Valley. I think this research will be eye-opening for many, and indeed, that is a large part of what we do here. It is part of the mission of a public library, I think, to bring new ideas and new areas of research to the attention of the public, to create a forum where people can encounter not only books and other media, but real live speakers who address a wide range of topics of importance to the times in which we live. We are truly lucky here in the Valley to be surrounded by so many fine academic institutions. And Professor Dillahenty came all the way from Springfield College and was generous enough to come up here to Sunderland to edify and enlighten us about his research on the extent and impact of slavery, both the enslavement of indigenous people and of Africans brought here against their will. Yes, slavery was not just a southern phenomenon, as many might believe. It happened right here in our midst. But first, a word from our sponsors. <laughs> Tonight's program forms a part of the library's social justice film and discussion series, which was funded through a grant from the Sunderland Cultural Council, a local agency, which in turn is funded by the Mass Cultural Council, a state agency. Our other co-sponsor is the Sunderland Human Rights Task Force, which formed over four years ago after a program we had right here in the library, in this very room, which goes to show that programs such as this one can have a lasting impact. I will now call upon Kim Audette from that group to say just a few words about Sunderland's Human Rights Task Force, and then Suzanne Ryan, also from that group, will introduce tonight's speaker. I'm very pleased by tonight's turnout, which is an indicator both of the importance of and the level of interest in these matters here in the Valley. Thank you all so much for coming. Hi, I'm Kim Audette from the Sunderland Human Rights Task Force, and I have to say that Aaron wears yet another hat. He is a member of our task force, and we are very lucky to have him and have the connection with the library because it's been a wonderful collaboration. So the sun, uh, the task, oh, sorry. The task force is a grassroots group committed to ensuring that all residents and visitors feel welcome, accepted, and safe in Sunderland, South County, and the Valley as a whole. We meet once a month to offer educational programs such as tonight's, to advocate for human rights, and to offer support and referral to area residents. We would love to have other interested neighbors join us. If you want to hear more or learn more, we have some flyers at the table if you didn't pick one up yet, or come talk to anybody with a name tag on later and we'd be glad to tell you a little bit more about all the programs that we've supported and hope to in the future. So let me turn this over to Suzanne now, another member, and she can introduce our speaker. Wow, I feel so official up here. Hello everyone, I'm Suzanne Ryan, as previously mentioned, and it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Um, Ian Delahanty is an associate professor of history at Springfield College, where he teaches in the humanities and social sciences department. He received his PhD from Boston College, and his book, Embracing Emancipation, 
A Transatlantic History of Irish Americans, Slavery, and the American Union, 1840 to 1865, will be published in the spring of 2024 by Fordham University Press. And we hope you'll come back and do some book signing that way. <laughs> that's really, congratulations, that's awesome. Ian's research and publications have focused on the intersections between Irish immigration and the transatlantic anti-slavery movement during the mid-1800s. His newest research focuses on New Englanders' involvement in and connections to African-American slavery between the 1600s and the 1800s. And in addition to his academic achievements, according to his three children, he gives the best horsey rides of anyone. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Professor Ian Delahanty. Thank you, Suzanne. It's bedtime back home for three kids, so appreciate everyone being here to get me out of one night's bedtime. It's always a little bit of a relief. Um, let me make sure this is going to work. It won't, which is why I do this. Well, maybe I can ask someone to toggle in the back if Aaron or, or someone else doesn't mind. We've got a, a non-working clicker. Um, what I want to do, and I'll just kind of set things up and we can get that sorted out, but it's not the end of the world if it won't work. Um, can everyone hear me back there, way in the back? I'll project. Um, it wasn't turned on. <laughs> so what, what I want to do in the next, I'm going to aim for 40 minutes or so to keep us, you know, not too, not up too, too late, uh, is really kind of map out three main arguments related to the broader subject of slavery's history in the Connecticut River Valley. And I'll kind of lay them out here to start. The first is that enslavement, and I'm talking both Native American as well as African and African American, influenced uh, the origins and early growth of English colonization in this region. Uh, throughout New England as a whole, but in particular in the Valley. You can't tell the history of the origins of English colonialism here without the, the, uh, the history of slavery as a, a central part of that. Second, I want to examine, and really I think this is the kind of the, the main point I want to draw out, is that Slavery had a wider footprint in valley communities than just the actual labor of enslaved people, uh, be they Native American or African or African American. And so I want to focus on the region's ties to other colonial slave societies, uh, especially in the British Empire, English Empire and then British Empire, uh, as well as focus on some of the, what I'll call the knock-on effects of slavery's presence in this region, the kind of indirect uh, benefits that uh, valley residents uh, gained from, from slavery slavery's uh, practice here. And then finally, and, and more briefly, I'll just touch upon some of the ambiguity surrounding the ends of slavery in Massachusetts, generally in kind of focusing on what that, what that uncertainty looked like through stories of emancipation uh, out here in the valley. And really what I'm aiming to do in, in this talk is kind of distill 10, 15 years worth of scholarship uh, from a number of, of, of different, you know, really uh, admirable and, and to me inspiring historians that have uh, brought the history of enslavement in this region into focus in ways that we, we just simply hadn't uh, done previously, we academic historians. Um, in 2021, I had the chance to take part in uh, this project, uh, documenting the history of early black lives in the Connecticut River Valley. Perhaps some folks here did as well. Uh, it sounds like there are definitely a few local uh, experts in the room. And uh, this was run by the Pioneer Valley History Network and the UMass Amherst Public History Program. Uh, if you leave here tonight wanting to know more, wanting to figure out how to do some of this research in local uh, libraries, archives, uh, probate records, uh, the likes, um, go to this website. Uh, it's operated, still exists through UMass. It also in it includes a wealth of resources uh, listing out uh, scholarship on the subject that I'm drawing from and kind of distilling down, as I said. Uh, they've organized it according to kind of different subject areas. It's really the kind of a great starting point for, for deeper inquiries into the histories of slavery uh, in this region. Um, and with that said, one of the kind of, kind of foundational insights, I think, from that recent scholarship is that any account of the history of slavery in colonial New England really has to begin with English colonists enslavement of Native Americans. And the practice of enslaving and trading native captives during the mid 17th century, during the mid 1600s into the late uh, 1600s, really kind of set in motion a chain of events that led both to the introduction as well as to the expansion of, of African and African American slavery in the, the Massachusetts colony, Massachusetts Bay colony, but also out here in the valley in particular. And so I want to begin 
here. Uh, Southern New England, 1635, we have the kind of map showing us a demographic landscape where if you focus on the kind of darker blue shaded regions, mm -hmm. uh, these are the, the limits of English colonization or colonial settlement in 1635. And as you can notice, it's, it's quite limited. It's, it's clinging to the coastline uh, from you know, Boston up to what's today present day Maine and New Hampshire, pockets along, of course, Plymouth, and then pockets along uh, the southern coastline of New England and Connecticut and in and around Hartford. This map, as we can see, will change significantly over the next 15 and then 25, 30 years, largely as a, largely as a consequence of uh, a conflict that takes place down here in 1636 and 37, uh, the Pequot War. And I want to examine the Pequot here, War briefly, but talk about uh, its, its connections to the, the origins and expansion of slavery here. This conflict fought 1636 to 37, it saw uh, combined elements of English militia from uh, colonies at Plymouth, Massachusetts Bay, and Rhode Island uh, with Mohegan and Narragansett allies. So the colonists actually jump into this war, which is, which is fundamentally an, an indigenous conflict over control of the fur trade. Uh, the Pequots control the fur trade. They're trading with the Dutch out in the New, ne New Netherland colony. Mohegans and, and Narragansetts aim to kind of capture that trade, redirect it, uh, and, and acquire wampum from the Dutch. And so this ongoing conflict is joined by colonists in, in southern New England. Uh, and the fighting kind of culminates in May 1637 when English militia uh, join uh, a, a group of, uh, I think it was Narragansett warriors uh, in Mystic, uh, Connecticut, or what becomes, of course, Mystic, Connecticut. Uh, down around here, Mystic was a, a kind of fortified area of the Pequot. And uh, this combined force of English and Mohegan uh, basically besieged the Pequots inside of a, a kind of circular fort, as you can see, kind of made out here. And they set fire to the fort. Uh, there's hundreds of, of Pequot men, women, and children inside. Many of the men are able to flee or are in an attempt to escape. Some are, are, are kind of shot down as they do so. Dozens, if not hundreds of more are successful. Those who don't perish, primarily women and children inside who survive, are captured and held in captivity by this uh, English militia and their, their native allies. And in the months that follow, English colonial militias continue to hunt down surviving Pequot men. They're, they're looking for men capable still of, of uh, you know, resisting uh, this, this joint uh, English and, and native uh, force. And while they capture and execute many of the Pequot leaders uh, and, and men of, of a fighting age, uh, they hold these surviving Pequot women and children captive. And under the terms of the, the treaty that ends this conflict, at least from the perspective of the, the English in New England, uh, the Treaty of Hartford, English colonial officials assigned surviving Pequot men, women and children captives to their Mohegan and Narragansett allies. Native peoples had historically uh, basically used captivity as a means of enslaving uh, one another and kind of replacing population loss, especially uh, once European diseases start to affect native populations. And so this is not to be, you know, it's not unexpected, right? The idea that Mohegans and Narragansetts would hold in captivity Pequots that, that are captured in war. But the colonists themselves also keep scores, likely hundreds of, of Pequot captives. And it's their fate that's different. And this, it's their fate, the fate of these surviving Pequot captives, that leads to this kind of crucial, pivotal moment in the history of slavery in, in Massachusetts generally uh, and out here in the Valley in particular. Uh, in May 1637, Governor John Winthrop of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, of course, Winthrop, one of the, you know, the founding father of Boston, essentially, uh, he writes uh, a letter, and he says as follows. He says, the prisoners were divided, some, uh, some to those of the river, and he's talking about the, the colonists in and around Hartford, mm -hmm. and some to us. Uh, us is a reference to the Massachusetts Bay colonists. And of those hundreds of Pequots taken captive by Massachusetts colonists, some 15 boys and two women were sent on board a ship named the Desire in June 1637. The Desire was based out of Salem. Uh, it left Salem in June with these, uh, I think, 18 or so uh, Pequot uh, captives on board. Uh, it was uh, aimed originally, I think, for the Bahamas. It got blown off course, and it ends up, where's my arrow, there it is, here, this small island off the coast of what's today Nicaragua. It's actually part of Colombia today, uh, Isla Providencia, or Providence Island. 
which in 1638 is actually an English Puritan colony. It's the same folks that have uh, colonized Boston, Hartford, New Haven, have also colonized in parts of the Caribbean as well. At Providence Island, uh, the captain, uh, William Pierce of the Desire, exchanges his human cargo as well as some other goods for, and this is how it's described in Winthrop's diary, for, quote, some cotton and tobacco and Negroes, etc., and salt. And that's how Winthrop records this transaction in his diary, because the desire then, making a couple of other stops in the Caribbean, uh, West Tortuga, where it, it again uh, kind of enters into this, this commerce and people, the uh, desire sails north, back up the East Coast, and arrives back in Boston around seven months after it had departed from Salem. And this transaction, uh, this transaction is in essence the first uh, recorded instance of New Englanders engaging in the slave trade, where they've taken surviving Pequot captives from the Pequot War, brought them to the Caribbean, traded them for enslaved Africans, and brought those enslaved Africans back to New England. So in 1638, you have the arrival of the first African slaves, uh, enslaved people in, uh, in the New England colonies. And uh, a letter written in 1635 by one of John Winthrop's kinsmen, there's Winthrop, Oop, wrong button again, there's Winthrop, but one of his kinsmen, a, a, a man named Emmanuel Downing, another colonist in, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, a letter he writes to Winthrop in 1645 helps to kind of shed some light on what's, what's happening here. And in this letter, uh, Downing basically is now encouraging Winthrop, who's still governor of Massachusetts, to make war upon the Narragansett. And if you have to remember, the Narragansett had only eight years earlier been allies to the, the English during the Pequot War. And Downing's really blunt here. If you're reading the, the, the text up here, the quote from this letter I've included, he's really blunt about why the English colonists should now wage war upon the Narragansett. He says that, quote, if upon a just war, the Lord should deliver the Indians into our hands, we might easily have men, women, and children enough to exchange for Moors. Mm. And that term Moors, shortened for Blackamoors, is a commonly used term to refer to uh, Africans uh, in, in the 1700s, 1600s, and uh, the 1800s. And so his argument is it's simple, if, if really uh, kind of crude in its, in its formulation. Uh, basically, he's looking for an, an, an inexpensive influx of, of labor. And he thinks this is the only thing that's going to keep the New England colonies solvent uh, as they're kind of trying to get their, their legs under them economically. And he, he goes on in this letter to say, quote, I do not see how we can thrive until we get a stock of slaves sufficient to do all our business. For our children's children will hardly see this great continent filled with people. In essence, he's, his solution to the problem of labor in colonial New England is to enslave native captives and trade them for enslaved Africans. And I think that letter kind of lays bare what uh, this historian, Wendy Warren, wrote this brilliant book on the, the history of the origins of slavery in New England. Uh, she calls this the deadly symbiosis, which is a phrase that always kind of grabs me. It's the deadly symbiosis of col colonization or colonialism and enslavement. And these things operate kind of hand in hand. Uh, throughout the 17th century in English North America, including in New England. And if that symbiosis is evident in the Pequot War, then it's on full display in 1675 and 76, uh, when English colonists in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut confronted a pan-Indian uprising that the colonists sort of euphemistically called King Philip's War, or might what, what otherwise be called Metacom's Rebellion. And as the, the, the map showing us where some of the major battles of this conflict took place. It's kind of across southern New England. Uh, it's hard to be a, a colonist or a native person in southern New England that isn't afflect, uh, affected, affected in some way by this, this years-long conflict. Um, it follows the course of English settlement and colonialism up the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, in fact, just on the eve of this conflict, colonists pushing north from Hadley had cleared several hundred acres of land. They divided lots, and they'd actually started to erect the first dwellings in Sunderland, what would become the town of Sunderland, which was then called Swampfield. Of course, they, they pull back almost immediately once fighting begins in 1675, and, and kind of it pauses for several decades, the actual uh, establishment of, of uh, Sunderland. Now, by the end of the war, I, you know, I'm skipping over a lot of the details here to kind of get to the, the key point, which is that by the end of the conflict, New English colonists hold some 2,000 Native Americans in captivity. And that's about 40%. It's about two out of every five indigenous people in southern New England uh, at the time. And over the coming weeks, months, year or so, uh, in groups of dozens and even hundreds at a time, the colonial authorities in Massachusetts Bay, in Plymouth, and Rhode Island, uh, they auction off uh, Narragansetts, Wampanoags, Nipmucks, Pocomtucks captives in order to basically recoup uh, 
the expensive of having waged this war. You have to remember entire uh, New English colonial townships are, are destroyed. Uh, it's been hugely costly to raise a militia and to, to rebuild these towns. They basically decide to do that. We will finance it through uh, the, the slave of these native captives, the, the sale of these native captives. Between August and September of 1676, for instance, the Massachusetts Bay Colony sold 190 native captives at auction while authorities in Plymouth auctioned off another 169 just in those two months. And within that process of capturing and enslaving native peoples deemed to be hostile to English colonialism was this opportunity to act uh, upon Emanuel Downing's advice to, to Governor Winthrop that we saw just a, a few decades earlier. And so ultimately more than one out of every four native captives seized uh, by Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, colonial authorities during King Philip's War are actually sold out of the colonies. They're not just held as captive slaves in New England, they're sold uh, abroad, as, as it were, right? And most end up uh, in English colonies like Jamaica, uh, Ber Bermuda, Barbados. Some, uh, some three dozen are sold at an English slave trading outpost in Tangiers in northern Africa, which is, to me, just fascinating to think about uh, what, what they experienced. Um, and still others are destined for the Azores, some end up in Spain. And what I think all this shows is that the, the peopling, the early development of colonial Massachusetts, even as far afield as you know, the kind of northern stretches of the, of the valley in Massachusetts, this is accomplished in no small part as a, as a consequence of the enslavement of native captives of war. And as we saw through the story of the desire, Massachusetts colonists' enslavement and the sale of Native Americans enabled them to procure the first enslaved Africans to set foot in the colony. And I think really we have to grapple with the fact that from the start, this is, this is foundational, Massachusetts is enmeshed in this kind of far-flung net, far network of slave trading and enslavement. And while it might have been removed from ports like Salem or Boston, eventually Bristol and Newport and Rhode Island, that act as the kind of conduits for that network, mm -hmm. the Connecticut River Valley still comes to function as kind of a, a vital node within it. And we need look no further than uh, the Pynchon family, the, the founders, the founding fathers, as it were, of, of Springfield, as well as you know, upwards of a dozen other townships out in western Massachusetts to understand how colonization was enmeshed in this network of, of slavery and slave trading. From 1636 until 1700, Springfield grew under its founder, William Pynchon, later his son, John, from what began as a lucrative fur trading post uh, to, in essence, the hub of agricultural cultivation and commerce in western New England. And after William the father returns to England in 1651, his son John assumed control of the family's interests in and around Springfield. And from that year in 1651 until his death in 1703, John oversaw the region's transformation into what becomes, in essence, like the, the breadbasket of, of New England, right? It's incredibly fertile land, huge amounts of, of vast open space and land that colonists can claim because of King Philip's War. Uh, and whether it's barley, wheat, livestock, you name it, uh, folks growing crops, raising animals out here, uh, many become wealthy uh, through, through provisioning food to other parts of, of New England. And in fact, in the case of John Pynchon, by provisioning foodstuffs to British Caribbean colonies, mm -hmm. which are almost entirely devoted to the growth of sugar uh, and aren't growing their own food. So by the 1680s, you've got pork, wheat, barley coming from up and down the valley into the Pynchon's general store in Springfield. And increasingly, rather than sending that food to Hartford or perhaps uh, you know, down the coastline to Boston, John, uh, John decides to, to ship it down to the Caribbean, to Barbados, Jamaica, the Leeward Islands uh, in particular. And it's not that he's, he's profiting from that sale, which sustains these slave societies in the Caribbean. He then, in exchange, is it is able to get things like rum, molasses, uh, sugar, and he has basically a near monopoly on these slave-grown goods uh, and, and foods that he can then in turn sell to you know, valley dwellers uh, throughout the, the late 1600s. Uh, in fact, in the 1680s, John even goes so far as to invest in a sugar plantation uh, off the island of, uh, on the island of Antigua. Uh, he gives it this terrible name, unlikely surely to fail name, Cabbage Tree Plantation. <laughs> and it fails, like very quickly, it, it, it goes basically belly up. But while it was up and running, John and his co-investors, they funded the purchase of dozens of enslaved Africans to labor on the plantation. Uh, and when the plantation went bankrupt, its assets were distributed not by a magistrate on Antigua, 
but by a debtor's court in Hartford. And included in the settlement of the, of the, the, the company's debts, basically, were four enslaved African children, a girl named Combo and three boys whose names were Mingo, Dick, and Jack. And all four were basically given over to uh, uh, Pynchon's co-investor, uh, a kinsman from Hartford named Richard Lord. And so even after John abandons this kind of attempt to, to establish a sugar plantation on Antigua, he still directs the bulk of his trade to the Caribbean. And he continues to profit from the slave-grown goods that he receives in exchange for these valley-raised crops and livestock. And with those profits, between 1680 and 1700, he purchases five enslaved Africans who come to live and labor under his control uh, in and around Springfield. And I really think we can't overstate John Pynchon's influence on the origins of valley communities during this time period, this kind of crucial period of, of growth for the New England colonies and Massachusetts in particular. At the direction of the Massachusetts General Court based in Boston, John Pynchon led the commission of every town founded in Western Massachusetts between 1653 and 1702. And I've got a number of these kind of starred on the map up here just to illustrate uh, you know, what townships we're talking about. Uh, again, as an example, kind of close to, 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 to where we are here, in 1673, the court commissioned Pynchon to see to the establishment of a new plantation north of Halley. Basically, they asked him and a couple of other folks, I think one was from Holyoke, clear 250 acres of land, kind of prepare this place for a future township that within seven years' time, we hope will be able to support a community that can hire a minister and incorporate as a town. Uh, this was the first step toward the eventual establishment of Sunderland. And seeing John Pynchon as not only the founding father of Valley Communities, but also as an enslaver who's tapping into these British networks of slave trading uh, and a slave-based economy in the Caribbean, I think brings into focus the place of slavery in the settlement and then in the early development of this region. So I want to kind of pivot here and ask, well, what about enslaved people themselves? Who are we talking about? What are their experiences uh, in this period? And of course, the, the, the records are very, very silent, so to speak, about this, right? We have John Pynchon's account book, which mentions, gives reference to you know, his purchase, uh, assigning an enslaved person to do a certain task, right? Uh, and we get some details, some glimpses into the lives through, through sources like this. One of the five Africans purchased by Pynchon uh, in this time period, the 1680s, was a man named Rocco. The year after Pynchon purchased Rocco in 1680, we know that Rocco married uh, a woman named Sue, who was also enslaved by Pynchon. We also know that in 1685, Rocco owned 60 acres of land in Springfield while still enslaved by Pynchon, and that a decade later in 1695, he's actually able to purchase his freedom. And he does this for the sum, as John Pynchon records it in his account ledger, for 1,000 gallons of turpentine uh, and 840 gallons of tar. Um, in Rocco's manumission papers, the, the documents that bestow his legal uh, condition of freedom upon him, um, another formerly enslaved man, once owned by, by Pynchon, a guy named Richard Blackleach, is listed as, quote, friend of Rocco and Sue, right? So we start to get these little glimpses into this kind of nascent uh, black community in the valley through, through records like this. And I also think that these snippets of Rocco's life help us to kind of see how the particulars of laws governing slavery in Massachusetts afforded enslaved people in the colony freedoms that were unobtainable uh, in the vast majority of English uh, America. In 1641, the Massachusetts General Court adopted uh, a, a document called the Body of Liberties as the Commonwealth's official legal code. And Article 91 of the Body of Liberties, which I've uh, copied out here, recognized, as you can see, the legitimacy of, quote, bond slavery, villainage, or captivity uh, in cases where individuals were lawful captives of war or were, quote, strangers, end quote, who were, quote, sold to us, mm -hmm. right? And strangers in uh, this context is non-Puritans, uh, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and this article, it's worth pointing out, this article actually made Massachusetts the first English colony in North America to give legal sanction to slavery. It happens here before it happens in Virginia. At the same time, Article 91 also accords to the enslaved, quote, liberties and Christian usages, end quote. In other words, it, it essentially recognizes their personhood. And in practical terms, this meant that they could marry, as we saw in the case of, of Rocco and Sue, although they have to ask the permission of Pynchon uh, to do so. They could own property, and they could file suit and testify in court. And as we'll see later, that last provision uh, will play a crucial role in the, the eventual demise of slavery in, in Massachusetts. So to this point, 
Uh, I've emphasized how, again, the, the settlement and the peopling of uh, Massachusetts in general, but Valley communities in particular, is influenced by these kind of regional uh, and imperial networks of slave trading uh, and slave, uh, slave base uh, uh, agricultural economies. But the references to Rocco, to Sue, to Richard Blackleach, uh, these are evidence of a much more simple fact, which is that enslaved Africans are present in the valley from the start, right, right, from, its, right from its kind of inception as an, as an area of English colonialism. And John Pynchon's account book, again, kind of backs this up. In 1657, uh, Pynchon records that he pays a man named John Leonard for, quote, bringing up the river, the Connecticut River, my Negroes, end quote. Right? So we know that in 1657, at the very least, is the first time John Pynchon uh, brings uh, enslaved uh, African people to, to Springfield. Seven years later, the estate uh, of a man named Richard Fellows in Hadley uh, is charged when an enslaved man who was enumerated in Fellows' will sold for less than he had been appraised for. And in 1695, John Williams, the, the famed kind of first minister of Deerfield, uh, we know he owned at this point at least one enslaved man, a man named Robert Tiggo, whose death was recorded in that year. And within less than a decade, by the time Williams, along with more than 100 other Deerfield residents, are captured by a joint uh, French Native American uh, raiding party in 1704, mm -hmm. we know he's also purchased two other enslaved people, Frank and Parthena. <coughs> so by the dawn of the 18th century, African and African American slavery has a, a foothold, if you will, in, in valley communities. And some numbers here, I think, are, are instructive, right? Rather than just these kind of isolated examples, what, what's the kind of numerical extent of it? If you look across the New England colonies, um, you find that the number of enslaved Africans and African Americans quintuples from 1708 to 1730 in just a couple of decades. It goes from 1,000 to about 5,000 in 1730. And then in the next two and a half decades, it, it doubles, more than doubles again. So that by 1754, we know there's around 13,000 300 enslaved uh, Africans or African Americans in, in the colony of Massachusetts. We know this from a 1754 census that was conducted uh, across Massachusetts townships, and I'll say a little bit more, more about that uh, in a few minutes. But that census reveals in 1754 that of the 140 incorporated townships in Massachusetts, 102 or 70 percent include uh, at least one enslaved uh, person. And at the local level, communities out here in the valley are, are represented in that total. Uh, just if you look, for example, at the ministerial class throughout the valley, two dozen ministers uh, in the valley owned uh, enslaved people. Uh, and you see up here, this chart provides their names, uh, the communities in which they, they ministered, their tenure there, and of course their alma maters, Harvard uh, and Yale. Um, and the most precise data we have for slavery in the valley and across the colony really comes from the census that I mentioned just a minute ago that was conducted in 1754 and 55. Now, I need to insert like a, a couple caveats here. Um, the data is incomplete. There's almost assuredly more than are included in the official tabulation. Some communities just simply didn't return it, right? It takes days, sometimes weeks, to get uh, from place to place, especially once you reach this part of the colony. Uh, and so paperwork gets lost. It never reaches its intended destination, its happenstance. Additionally, data from some communities was lost before this information was actually published in 1815. So it's not actually published until several decades later, and by that time, uh, the original records uh, have, have been lost from some communities, and so we just simply don't know what they were. And I think most importantly, the census specified that communities should report only the number of, quote, Negro slaves 16 years old and upward. So it says don't count anyone if they're younger than, than 16. And that means there's almost certainly some unknown number of enslaved boys and girls younger than 16 in the valley and across the colony, really. And let me explain why, why we would suspect that's the case. So most of the slaving vessels that brought enslaved Africans to New England uh, made at least one, if not multiple, stops in the Caribbean prior to their arrival. Right? This was their final destination, but certainly not their only destination. In the Caribbean, white planters would seek out uh, healthy-looking, working-aged uh, men, because they thought these are the people from whom we can extract the maximum amount of labor in these really brutal uh, working uh, conditions in, in the brutal climate uh, of the Caribbean sugar uh, economy. So New England slave trading vessels would then return to ports like Boston, Bristol, uh, Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island, with captive Africans who were deemed less valuable by Caribbean enslavers. And these tended to be the sick and especially the young. And so for this reason, a census that counted only enslaved people younger than 16 almost inevitably misses some, no, some 
unknown number of younger African-born slaves in the region. But still, the, the numbers are, are still there. We can still find uh, you know, kind of scattered, uh, scattered uh, data about how many there are in certain communities. And they're instructive, especially when we look at it kind of comparing it with where, where we know more about uh, in communities where we'd have firmer numbers. So if you look across, again, across the region, across New England, Africans and African Americans made up about 3% of the population by the mid-1700s, by the 1750s. And the figures listed here for the total numbers in places like Springfield, Hadley, Hatfield, and Westfield uh, come out to roughly 3% or so. In, in uh, Westfield, it's definitely lower. But if you take into account that the total figures uh, would likely be higher because of the unknown number of people that aren't counted uh, in this census, we would suspect that the, the numbers are going to bump up a little bit uh, and that we'd be, reach around 3%. Um, one additional data point, or just kind of point of reference here, is this incredible study by someone who's not an historian. I think it was he a physicist? Does anyone know? A physicist. physicist, right? Um, and you know, I'm incredibly envious that a physicist is able to produce a, a, a study <laughs> like this. Um, it's it's a, a lesson for us historians, I suppose. Uh, Robert Romer's uh, study of slavery in uh, Massachusetts and New England, but Deerfield in particular, uh, has this really comprehensive accounting of not just how many, but who they were and where they lived. And he, uh, without access to this slave census, I should emphasize, he, we don't have the Deerfield returns to that slave census. So he looked in tax lists, wills, probate inventories, church records, merchant, merchant's account books, you know, diaries, basically anywhere where he could find information and created it from those sources, this map of Deerfield's Main Street as it, as it looked in 1752 with the names of 25 enslaved uh, men and women, prints, you know, anonymously named Negro, female, Caesar, Meshach, Ishmael, etc., as well as the, the people that claim those folks as property uh, in these places. And what he found is that those 25 people who live on this less, less than one mile stretch of road in Deerfield made up about 8% of the total population in this area. Right? So if you're walking down the street, there's a one in 10 chance you're bumping into one of these folks, is the way I tell my students to think about it. Right? They're present, you can't, you can't escape them, they're, they're part of the community. Um, and that puts Deerfield closer to Boston in terms of black slave share of the population. About 10% of Boston uh, are enslaved Africans and African Americans. And as was the case in Springfield, Hadley, and Westfield, the ratio of enslaved men to women here is roughly three to one. So that's why I say these communities all kind of more or less resemble each other in terms of share of the population and the kind of gender uh, demographics. And so as slavery becomes more commonplace throughout the Commonwealth, uh, and in the Valley in particular, we find new laws uh, enacted that served to circumscribe some of the small liberties that the Valley's first enslaved people like Rocco had enjoyed. And I've highlighted a few of these here, I won't go through them kind of individually, but just point out some, like the ban on serving alcohol to slaves, apprentices, or servants, or the ban on, quote, Indian, Negro, and mulatto slaves, end quote, from being out in public past nine o'clock. These laws reflected fears among white colonists that growing numbers of unfree people in their communities might become rebellious, might foment uh, discord among them. Other laws, like the classification of slaves as chattel for tax purposes, uh, the requirement of a 50 pound bond from any slave owner who freed his slave. So remember John Pynchon manumitting Rocco uh, wouldn't have been able to do that now without paying a 50 pound bond uh, as a result of this law and especially the ban on interracial sex and marriage. Mm -hmm. right? These aim to cement enslaved people's status as a permanent and perpetual dependent class. So as this is happening, we can look at you know, individual lives and individual stories and, and see how this benefits uh, both individual families but also larger communities that those families are part of. And I wanna do that with respect to someone many folks might be familiar with, uh, the pastor of Northampton, uh, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Edwards was the pastor at the Congregational Church in Northampton from 1729 to 1750. He's one of the most famous and influential preachers in colonial New England. His sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, is a kind of you know, staple of American literature. Um, and Edwards had, in fact, grown up in a slave-owning family in Connecticut. Shortly after he assumed the pastorate in Northampton, he traveled to Newport, Rhode Island uh, in the early 1730s, and he purchased there an enslaved girl named Venus for the sum of 80 pounds. He also owned, during his tenure in Northampton, a woman named Leah, uh, an enslaved woman named Rose, and an enslaved boy named Titus, 
who some scholars think might have been Rose's son. And given his notoriety, uh, given his importance to the history of this region in particular, I want to just kind of unpack what his slave ownership meant, what it signified about the, the place of slavery uh, in uh, kind of the New England countryside, in the valley uh, especially. So on the one end, we can see Jonathan Edwards as an enslaver kind of conforming to earlier patterns and practices of slavery uh, throughout the colonies, including in New England. Ministers like Edward, uh, especially in New England, ministers are among the most important, in fact, probably the most important men in their communities. Slave ownership signifies an elevated status. It's not an economic necessity. Uh, it's what uh, the historian Marla Miller uh, aptly describes, I think, as a, quote, affirmation of affluence, right? This, this way to show outwardly uh, that you are chosen and blessed by God. Uh, it's a luxury that the likes of ministers or merchants, militia officers can afford uh, to signify their kind of elevated status in a society that's deeply hierarchical, not just between free and enslaved, but among the free people themselves. But I think Edwards' use of enslaved labor, his, his uh, command of enslaved labor, also signaled a transition in the practice of slavery uh, across the New England countryside that's happening in the mid-1700s. And that transition coincides with, and I think, I really think it, it helps to propel two larger changes happening in this region. The first is something called the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening was a period of intense religious fervor that erupted uh, among the first places here in, in the valley in Northampton under Edwards's, uh, within Edwards's congregation, where you see church attendance rates skyrocket, this kind of new, more outwardly emotional style of worship and preaching take hold. Uh, the, the painting up here doesn't depict Edwards. It's a famous itinerant preacher named George Whitfield, probably the most celebrated and known public figure in, in 18th century uh, English-speaking world. And you see here is you know, the, the upstretched arms, the woman clutching her, her chest in front of him, people in these kind of you know, different fits of emotional states, outdoors, right? This is the hallmark. These are the traits. This is what the revival looks like, kind of on the ground. And it means that you have people flocking to church, but also consulting, seeking their minister's counsel outside of church worship. And ministering to these swelling congregations that we see in Northampton and other communities during the Great Awakening, that's time consuming for ministers like, for, like Jonathan Edwards. He and other ministers in the valley don't have the time they would ordinarily need for the kind of mundane necessities of living in colonial New England, like repairing fences, slaughtering pigs, shoeing horses. These are the things that ministers still have to do. Drawing upon enslaved labor not only freed up time for Edwards to devote to his ministry, but of course it also assists his wife Sarah in raising and caring for the couple's 11 children. Now the second transformation uh, in the New England countryside that I think is, is abetted by enslaved labor during the 18th century is the, what's called the Consumer Revolution. Uh, what's happening is that in response to rising consumer demand uh, during the mid to late 1700s, you have more and more farmers and artisans growing crops and producing goods, respectively, not for household domestic consumption, not to consume within their own families, but instead to sell to an expanding consumer base. Right? Uh, and I say expanding consumer base both numerically, there's more people buying goods, but also geographically. Uh, you're buying goods from further afield than your own, your own township or, or community. As a consequence, not only these artisans and farmers, but also an emerging class of professionals, uh, doctors, lawyers, the like, they find more and more of their time occupied by business beyond that of their household economy, which is the kind of organizing force in people's lives up until this time. The labor of enslaved Africans and African Americans freed up time for these lawyers, doctors, and merchants to go to court, to visit patients, or to transact business. And it also, control over enslaved labor enabled artisans to produce more goods for, a cons for an expanding consumer base. And it allowed farmers, and I think this is really the key out here in the valley, to add livestock, perhaps, to their, their fields, or to plant different crop varieties, or to simply expand their acreage, basically, right? One historian describes this process as follows. She says, quote, someone was needed to take up the slack, so to speak, as household heads sought to diversify their productive activities for both exchange in the markets, and the someone is, of course, enslaved people who are increasingly used for these purposes. For this reason, by the 1720s, what you see is that a majority of slave owners in New England aren't the ministers or the wealthy merchants, the kind of elites that had typically been to this point. They're the middling classes. It's the farmers and artisans uh, of, of a given community. There's one final point to be made here with respect to slavery's impact on the economic development of uh, New England and a valley in particular during the 1700s. And that is to say that one need not have been a slave owner 
in order to benefit from the practice of slavery uh, in or around one's community. Enslaved men and women required food, clothing, shoes. Uh, many, as we saw in the case of Rocco, uh, might have accumulated small earnings that they could spend perhaps in a local shop. And they almost certainly required a physician's care at some point or another in their lives. Tailors, cordwainers, vendors, doctors up and down the valley benefited from their townspeople practice of enslavement in these ways. And let me just give a concrete example to illustrate this point. 1764, Dr. Thomas Williams of Deerfield treats uh, Titus. Titus was a 24-year-old enslaved man owned by another Deerfield resident named Daniel Arms. Now we don't know why uh, Titus sought Dr. Williams' service on this particular occasion. But we do know that at some point in time in the 1760s, the precise date's unclear, but we know that Titus was whipped severely for having stolen rum, eggs, and bread from the store of a Major Williams in Deerfield. And according to a story that's kind of passed down over a few decades and finally recorded uh, in around 1840 in a kind of local history of Deerfield, Major Williams, quote, drew blood with every stroke, end quote, as he whipped Titus uh, for his alleged crime. And so perhaps it's this, it's this whipping that led Titus to seek out Dr. Williams, or perhaps it was some more trivial malady. But whatever the case, Titus ends up paying off part of the debt he owed to Dr. Williams by cutting tobacco for him. Mm -hmm. And on other occasions, Titus' owner, Daniel Arms, paid for his own medical care by renting out Titus' labor to the doctor. Other men in Deerfield who found themselves sporadically in need of higher labor uh, could procure Titus' work could procure his, his services, as well as another enslaved man owned by Daniel Arms named Matthew, which they did on many occasions in the 1750s and 60s. We have uh, Arms' own kind of uh, ledger book, uh, kind of documents who he's hiring these men to, what they're doing, and what he's paid for their services. They spent their days plowing, cutting wood, scoring timber, spreading manure on farms, uh, and in clearing fields across, uh, across Deerfield. And of course, it benefits those farmers whose land's being cleared or manured. It also benefits quite significantly Daniel Arms. He gets anywhere between two and 10 shillings a day when he hires out uh, Titus and, and Matthew. And so here's what I think we can say to kind of wrap up the second point uh, with some certainty about the presence and impact of slavery in the valley during the, the, the 18th century. The first, and again, the simple point is that enslaved Africans and African Americans are present from the start in many valley communities, but more substantively, they're present in enough numbers in places like Springfield or Deerfield, Hadley, Westfield, and Northampton to constitute a really important component of the labor force, right? Their local economies, the way they interact with regional economies would have looked different without these folks' presence uh, in labor. And the second kind of main point to drive home here is that enslaved labor played an important role in the cultural and economic transformations of the region. It freed up professionals from the menial uh, labors of the household and it enabled them to devote more time to the commercial, intellectual, and religious pursuits that became kind of you know, major elements of, of New England's history in this period. Artisans and farmers in the valley, they used slave ownership or the sporadic employment of enslaved labor to increase productivity and to diversify their operations as they entered into an increasingly market-driven economy. And so it's for these reasons that the ends of slavery in Massachusetts don't come easily and they don't come with the type of clarity, at least on paper, that the abolition of slavery nationally does uh, in 1865. And in discussing and bringing us to kind of the conclusion, the ends of slavery in Massachusetts, I should stipulate it at first one point, which is that Massachusetts is no different from any other colony or slave society in a basic fact, which is that enslaved people in the Commonwealth sought to become free by running away for as long as slavery existed here. Whether you're reading newspapers in Boston, Salem, uh, Newport, or the Connecticut Current, which is you know, usually the, the kind of paper or record out in this direction, it will include throughout the 1700s advertisements uh, for the possible whereabouts uh, for folks looking for fugitives from slavery uh, in uh, and around the valley. Now that's a risky proposition uh, to be caught, is to risk being uh, mutilated, uh, you know, branded, hamstrung, uh, having holes bored through your tongue, some of the punishments inflicted upon escaped runaways who are captured. And so a less risky option than running away was uh, unique to Massachusetts, was filing what were called freedom suits, which uh, we know of because they produce copious legal records and the type of records that historians love uh, in the 1700s. Freedom suits were brought by individual enslaved Africans and African Americans who sued their owners uh, for some specific infringement of a contractual obligation 
or on an allegation that their title, because they are, after all, in the eyes of the law, property, that the owner's title to them was somehow defective uh, and therefore void. Uh, in successful cases, these men and women became free. And uh, I want to emphasize this isn't a widely available means of becoming free. We know of no more than 30 successful freedom suits that, were, that are, are brought prior to 1780. And the majority of those are brought after 1764. But included in that total were seven women, one of whom you see here, a woman named Mum Betts, uh, or later her, the name she adopts, Elizabeth Freeman. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about the, the case of Mum Bett or Elizabeth Freeman. She was born in 1742 to an enslaved woman in New York, and she and her sister Lizzie were inherited by the husband of her owner's daughter. The man who inherited them uh, was Colonel John Ashley of Sheffield, Massachusetts, and coincidentally, Ashley was the cousin uh, of Deerfield's minister at the time, Jonathan Ashley. In Sheffield, Mum Bett becomes acquainted with this attorney, uh, a young attorney named Theodore Sedgwick from Stockbridge, and she asks him to file one of these freedom suits on her behalf. And we don't know exactly what prompted her to do so. It's kind of in some dispute what leads to her doing this. But what we know is that in 1781, Sedgwick files a freedom suit on Elizabeth's behalf, as well as on behalf of a man uh, who's, who's known as Brom. And so the case becomes Brown and Bett v. Ashley. It's heard in the Berkshire County Court of Common Pleas, which rules that Ashley has no claim upon Brom and Bett and awards both of them their freedom. Bet soon after adopts the name Elizabeth Freeman in celebration of this new status. So on the one hand, the, the, the Brahm and Bet case uh, lacked the caveats within other 18th century freedom suits that had limited the kind of scope of those rulings. What I mean by that is that Bet hadn't sued on the basis of some contractual violation or the basis of some defective title that was specific to her or specific to Brahm. Her case rested instead on the presumption that slavery was incompatible with Article I uh, of the newly enacted state constitution of Massachusetts. This is, of course, amidst the American Revolution. The states are adopting their own constitutions. Uh, and Article I of the state constitution of Massachusetts reads, all men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights, kind of cribbing from the Declaration of Independence. And this was a novel approach. Again, it's not a specific claim upon the, the contract or the terms of uh, Ashley's ownership of her or her Brahm. It's about the fundamental nature of slavery and whether it is legally compatible with this new state constitution uh, that uh, these revolutionary uh, ex-colonists have adopted. Now, on the other hand, it's unclear then, and it remains unclear now, what led the jury to rule in her and Brahm's favor. Right? We don't know if they based their decision to free Mum Bet on Article I, or if there was some other kind of technicality that had swayed the jury uh, to rule in, in uh, Mum Betts and, and Brahms' favor. And because Ashley didn't appeal the decision, the case remained localized in its scope. It doesn't have applicability beyond uh, Berkshire County, in other words. So the significance of, her, significance of her case emerges two years later in 1783, when uh, an enslaved man from Worcester County named Quack Walker sues for his freedom from and also brings criminal assault charges against his enslaver, a guy named Nathaniel Jennison. So he says both, I'm suing to become free, but I'm also filing criminal assault charges against you uh, as, as well. Jennison responds by filing his own lawsuit. He sues two brothers whom he alleges had prompted uh, Quack Walker to escape from him and sheltered him uh, illegally. And so you have these three kind of cases up in the air at once. It kind of defies easy narration. But it's the assault case that reaches the state Supreme Court in 1783. And so remember, this is an assault case. It's not a case to test uh, Quack Walker's freedom. But the judge in this trial and that reaches the state Supreme Court in 1783, Chief Justice William Cushing, in instructing the jurors in how to decide uh, this case, tells them that they should consider Quack Walker a free man on the basis of Article I of the 1780 state constitution. He tells them slavery, quote, was as effectively abolished as it can be by the granting of rights and privileges, end quote, that are enumerated in Article I. And so this seems like a pretty open and shut case. You have the state Supreme Court justice saying slavery is no longer compatible mm -hmm. with, with our state constitution. But uncertainty lingers. Cushing's act of what has come to be called judicial emancipation was not an official decision of the court. It's part of his instructions to the jury in a criminal assault case. 
Cushing had spelled out clearly an argument for the legal indefensibility of slavery in Massachusetts, but we shouldn't interpret this case as the death knell of slavery because, in fact, there would be no death knell. There is no magic moment when slavery becomes uh, illegal, so to speak. The combined effects of freedom suits brought by Mumbet and Quack Walker in conjunction with the enactment of Article I mean that from 1783 onward, any freedom suit brought by an enslaved person will almost assuredly meet with success. Right? But the suit still has to be brought. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't mean that people just become free automatically. They have to find someone to file suit for them or to file suit themselves. Additionally, fugitives, fugitives from slavery could now rest assured that the state's legal system would reject any attempt on the part of an enslaver to reclaim someone that they said was their property. Right? Uh, if you're captured and, and someone sues to say, I, you belong to me, the state, court, the state court system will now say, no, not anymore. But that still puts the onus on enslaved people to try to liberate themselves. They still have to get up and leave, basically. Mm -hmm. And so as a consequence of this, slavery lingers on in Massachusetts past judicial emancipation, including in valley communities. If you look at tax lists from 1784 to 85, they, many of them in Hadley, Hatfield, Springfield, Deerfield, Westfield, Amherst, Greenfield, and Northfield, they all include this term, servants, under people's taxable property in 1784 and 1785. And servants is oftentimes used synonymously with slave uh, by this point in time. In Deerfield, to give her another example, uh, the will of a woman named Abigail Silliman that's written in 1785 and then executed after her death in 1787, freed an enslaved woman named Chloe. But that's four years. That's four years after Cushing's ruling uh, in the Clock Walker case. And outside of the valley, if you look across the Commonwealth, advertisements for fugitives from slavery and bills recording slave sales can still be found for years after 1783. And so as a result of this ambiguity, freedom is delayed or it's simply denied altogether due to these kind of evasive tactics on the part of uh, enslavers. Go back to Nathaniel Jennison, right, the man who had lost his claim to Quack Walker, uh, in that case I mentioned just a minute ago. After losing his case, Jennison brings the remaining people he claims as his property to Connecticut, and he sells them there. Right? because this is the way he's going to maintain his, his ability to profit from them. Other enslavers like John Ashley Jr. of Sheffield would pressure African Americans whom they had formerly claimed to own to sign indenture contracts uh -huh. upon giving them their, their, their freedom. Indentured servitude will remain legal in the state for years to come. And indenture contracts, it's crucial to remember, indenture contracts could be and were bought and sold, giving an uncanny resemblance to a defining feature of slavery. In 1788, the Massachusetts General Court uh, banned the practice of selling out, um, uh, selling out African Americans from the state. And the mere existence of that law in 1788 is evidence of the practice of selling black people out of the state five years after this so-called judicial emancipation had occurred. And so ultimately, we simply don't know when, how, and on what terms the thousands of enslaved people in Massachusetts in 1783 became free. Some like Jenny and Cato Ashley. Here's the, the summary of the Clock Walker case I should have gotten to earlier. Uh, but to, to wrap up here, Jenny and Cato Ashley, uh, their story kind of reflects these kind of ambiguities. So Jenny was born in Africa sometime around 1722. She was captured into the transatlantic slave trade as a child. And by the time she was purchased in Boston in 1738 by the Reverend Jonathan Ashley, uh, she was the mother of a young son uh, whom she named Cato and whom Ashley also purchased uh, and, and brought with him out to Deerfield. For the next seven decades, Jenny toiled in and around the Ashley's house, uh, which you can see here today. Uh, Cato did the family's kind of farm work and it's kind of transacted its business in and around town. And there's no record of them having ever left this household. They lived for several decades. In fact, um, Cato lives the rest of his life in Deerfield well into the early 1800s. And we can only speculate as to why Jenny and Cato never left the home of their enslaver in the decades after emancipation had purportedly occurred. One plausible reason, of course, is that like so many other African Americans in the Valley at this time, they lacked the resources or the prospects for employment that would enable them to live independently. Freedom doesn't come with back pay or the promise of wages going forward. At the same time, and to conclude, I want us to consider the possibility on a kind of different angle on this, that Jenny and Cato's decision to live and to work in the home of their former enslavers uh, 
was more than just a matter of economic necessity. In essence, it was a claim. It was a claim to that being theirs, to the community being their own, and to their place of belonging being here. And on that note, I'll end. Thank you for your attention and welcome any questions you might have.